The Ford Foundation uh, is taking real leadership in this area, so it's a great pleasure that Zav Briggs from the Ford Foundation is joining us here today and speaking in conversation uh, with Stefan Chambers from the Marshall Centre at the London School of Economics. Stefan, Zav, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it is a very great pleasure and a privilege to be here with you uh, this morning. And it's a greater privilege still to be in conversation with Sav Briggs. Um, when I first spoke to Michael about this session, he said, look, it's very straightforward. What we'd like the conversation to do is to examine the barriers to positive social change, everything from policy to culture and basically just to understand the key challenges and how we overcome them. And I gulped. And I said, well, I'm not sure we can do all that in half an hour. He said, don't worry. You don't have to do it. Zav will do it for you. So Zav, many of you know, is a genuine polymath. He's an academic, a foundation executive, he's an award-winning author. He's an advisor to government. Uh, his list of achievements is astonishing. Um, and we hope that in the next half an hour or so, we will get under the skin of some of these complicated, knotty questions. And I would like you to do some of the lifting for us. So I'd like you to start thinking now about the questions you're going to ask. We've decided to give over roughly half of this session to the floor. So start thinking now about what you're going to ask as soon as I say, right, who's got the first question. Try to compose the question in the form of a question. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, Zav, you have written that at their best, democracies confront important public problems. Mm -hmm. I read that as saying that at their worst, they don't. And there's already been some intimation this morning that we're at a point of worse. Mm. Can you give us a kind of sense of, of how you, wh what you've learned about inclusive development over, over the course of an extraordinary career? Mm. Well, you know, on one hand, we've talked about some of it already this morning, that inclusive development, inclusive progress is about shared gains. As Michael says, it's not enough to have aggregate measures average measures, at the end of the day, there's no average Nigerian or average American or average Icelander. So we need to pay attention to disparities, to inequalities. Um, but the question is, you know, what does it mean for democracies in particular to be up to the challenge? And not just democracies, but all forms of, of political system. And I think that one of the things that uh, our own work at the Ford Foundation has led us to, you see in the video this intent to focus on, on inequality, we've also asked ourselves, well, what are the drivers of inequality? What are the things that societies, if we're going to take an all-in uh, sort of approach, that they need to tackle? And we concluded, based on a conversation with uh, teams and experts and stakeholders and communities around the world, that it's, it's drivers like... Um, dominant cultural narratives that undermine fairness and tolerance and in inclusion, that normalize, in fact, exclusion. And religion, by the way, plays a tricky role in that. We've talked about gender equity so far this morning. We haven't so much talked about backlash against mm -hmm. gender equity, which has been very, very pronounced, especially over the last generation. Uh, another driver, unequal access to government decision-making and, and resources. It takes different forms in different countries, but tremendously important. And then rules of the economy, too, that magnify um, inequality in, in various ways, as opposed to reducing it. Is, is our narrative, is the language of development, is the language of positive pro-social intervention, is the language of sustainability one of those dominant narratives? Mm. In other words, are we, do, are we complicit in, in any of the problem? Well, I think we are, and I think it, it is a language the, the terms you use, the reference points you use, that work for some people and are quite compelling and welcoming. Um, but there's also a, a danger in it. Um, I'll refer to it as the, the sort of enlightenment theory of, of social change, 
we're going to discover our way to social progress, we're going to find that staring us in the face, there were these solutions, only if we'd known them, we would have pursued them much earlier. There's that old line by Lula, the former president of Brazil, if making a, a country rich were easy, someone else would have done it already. Um, you know, tackling important problems, especially if you do it under democratic conditions of real debate, real dissent, political competition, competition of ideas, entails asking questions um, about where that language obscures, um, about whether some publics need a, a more moral language, and some do, and respond to one, and of what it means to face up to what's hard in this conversation, too. Where are the contradictions? And what is it about the status quo, as Michael said, that business as usual won't do? Well, what do we want to unwind exactly? So where are the contradictions? Well, what, where have you found those, those flaws in the logic of smooth progress? One concerns um, the role of traditional institutions. I mean, in, in some ways, I feel as though in my country, in the States, we are still fighting the culture wars of the 1960s. And that has to change. And one of the ways in which we are doing it is with respect to gender, traditional roles, conceptions of the family as the bedrock of society, and so on. Um, organized religion and faith and politics are a large force in, in American life and American politics. And some of the contradictions we need to work through um, are about espousing the language of equality and, and freedom on one hand, but on the other, undermining things like access to universal health care, uh, especially for poor women, women of color, rural women, um, women who face additional barriers. That's one example. There are many mm. such contradictions. So, so one of the arguments I've heard a lot in the last six, nine months is that those who see the blue dress and those who see the gold dress aren't... Uh, inhabiting each other's perspective mm -hmm. well enough. And one of the features of the culture wars is precisely that. Mm -hmm. So how do we get beyond the you're a blue dress, I'm a gold dress person? Because it, it matters for this, for this movement. It matters enormously. I, I think in our experience and in, in what I've observed and sometimes been able to, to write and teach about, uh, a good deal of it has to do with engagement of a different sort, um, engagement that focuses on creating a shared language as opposed to showing up with a language and trying to persuade someone to adopt it. The latter won't always work. Sometimes it's the most off-putting, the most patronizing, um, the least effective invitation to real engagement. Um, it's also an, an engagement, it seems to me, that seeks to listen and to forge spaces where we can be in these conversations over time. I don't want to stick to politics alone, though it's bound up with culture and bound up with policy, obviously, as drivers of change. But to use politics one more time, um, it is one thing to do organizing. It's quite another to sort of show up around election time with slogans and with promises and to hope that you're ever going to do something about this tremendous polarization, this sort of retreating to sides, um, and the sense that you know, e each side of a debate or all sides of a debate feel like the other side does not even respect them. It's not just a question of disagreement. It's a lack of recognition mm -hmm. and a lack of respect for one's worldview and one's understanding of why the world is operating the way it is. This is a hard and possibly unfair question. But you and I speak the language. We're both gold dress people. Why are there so few people in this movement, in an organization like ours, in a, in a movement like ours, who don't believe in the movement? And is it, do we need to get there before we get anywhere further on? And, and what are you referring to as the movement? Pro-social alliance of at least three sectors, markets, states, and non-market actors mm -hmm. for the the kind of goals enshrined in the in the in the slide we saw half an hour ago. Mm -hmm. I think there there are many answers to that, and it's hard to generalize for the whole globe. And here again, I've concluded that inequality is playing a, a fairly central role 
it has become so extreme, and by some measures, as you know, is, is still worsening. And it has produced um, a tremendous anxiety. It has deepened resentments. It is, at this point, eroding our, our politics, our, our, our democratic potential, our capability, not just things like economic growth, though it's also undercutting that. And as we've seen, even in recent months, what's at stake is not only the sort of fundamental freedoms and others that are in the social progress uh, framework, the SBI framework, but even things like an informed public sphere, having a majoritarian coalition stand up for facts and declare um, you know, that we will, we will contest, but in this shared space where we have a decent respect for the facts, that too is now endangered. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. I don't know whether this is a cause for celebration or alarm, but a very long time ago, um, uh, I was a publisher and I published someone else's um, his book in historical linguistics. And in that book was the etymology of the word progress, which of course it means forward m movement. And that word was abandoned in British English some point about two thirds of the way through the 18th century. It just fell out of use until it was readopted in, in, in American English at some point during the first half of the 19th century and then re-imported back to my country as the notion of progressive social improvement. Whether this is a cause for rejoicing or a cause for anxiety, I don't know. Mm. Um, my last question before we go to the floor um, uh, is which, si which side of the which side of the kind of teleological debate are you on? Are you of the view, of the kind of enlightenment view, that if we keep working, we keep understanding more, uh, indices show us more, not only about the average, but about the, the, the normal distribution of, let's call it social justice, mm -hmm. um, we are tending in the right direction? Or are you a kind of punctured equilibrium person who says, look, it gets better for a bit, then it gets worse for a bit? Th that's a tough one. I'm, I'm a yes and person. It's supposed I, to be a tough one. I, it is a tough one. I would say it is both the case, having made the earlier point about you know discovering our way to, to progress and sometimes overlooking contradictions that we need to work through, questions of power and privilege that we need to work through. Having said that, it, it is also the case, I think, that there has been tremendous measurable progress that is worth celebrating. I am a glass is half full person, sort of in keeping with Gloria Steinem's mm. uh, remarks in the video. And, uh, and yet, I think we have to acknowledge that at times we are in the sort of two steps forward, one back um, mode. And that for every Im important and, and really transformational sort of step forward, there will probably be backlash. I'm a fan of history and I love to comb through the archives, and it reminds you, it, it humbles you, that there are only so many new ideas under the sun. I'm struck by the thinking of my forebears in this incredibly privileged role in philanthropy. In the 1960s, as best I can tell, people in the Ford Foundation genuinely believed there would continue to be steady progress yeah. on women's rights, yeah. on uh, uh, the civil rights movement, so many different voting rights, all of these things. And that's not exactly what we've seen, whether in the US or, or other parts of the world. And I think we need to acknowledge that and learn from it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I promised right at the beginning that we would, we would try to share this session with you. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to try to be as good as my word now and ask for the first perfectly honed question for Sav. Here's the first question here. I'll come to you in a minute. I, you had a question before. So good morning. My name is uh, Guillermo Valles. Take the mic for us. My name is Guillermo Valles. I come from Uruguay, and uh, and I happen to work at, with the UN as well. Uh, my question is very simple: Are there trade-offs? You spoke about conflicts, backlash. Are there trade-offs in in bringing social inclusion? And the reason why I'm asking this is because we also have the semantic or the etymological uh, changes and, and ups and downs in our region. And with all respect to our Brazilian colleagues, in the very flag of Brazil, it says, Ordem e progresso. Mm -hmm. Order is progress. Mm -hmm. Now, in our concept, perhaps, 
progress and social progress perhaps is working against certain order. Okay, are there trade-offs? Guillermo, thank you. Uh, there are. I think it would be disingenuous, ultimately ineffective for us to pretend that everything is win-win. Um, the conversation the earlier panel was having about long-termism and long-term perspectives in the marketplace is a, is a case in point. You know, in, in the near term, there are a variety of trade-offs that we should have honest conversations about, I think. And then we need to say, but looked at over the long term, we will not have either competitive, legitimate, respected businesses, robust economic growth, go on down the list without political, social, uh, cultural inclusion. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question of you, just before we go to the next question of us? How many of you, on a show of hands, think that if we knew more, we would make, we would make better policy? In other words, that, that, that the key obstruction is our understanding of the social, financial, physical realities. How many of you believe that? If we, if we, just, if we just had a better analytical foundation, progress would follow. That's a smallish minority. How, okay, still a smallish minority. How many people think that it's not the knowing more, it's the acting in more coordinated, um, less politically um, constipated manner? That is a slightly bigger group of people, I think. Okay. How about both? How Who about said both? how about both? Yeah, very good. Who, whose hands up for both? It's clearly, clearly both is, is where we're going. Right, question, second question from the floor. Yeah, my name is Kristin Vala, again from the University of Iceland. How do we change the narrative when the world narrative is dominated by the neoclassical narrative, which means um, the, the market is free, we got it. Uh, no regulations, mm -hmm. money should flow, mm -hmm. and now it's going into tax havens and being taken away from our societies. Thank you, it's, it's a crucial question. So on one hand, if going back a moment, we were sort of taking the measure of uh, two forms of re reductionism. Uh, we will discover our way, and it's, it's all discovery and knowledge versus it's all about power. If only we could shift it. it. It's about both. It will require both. And on this front, here's what I think experience has, has taught us so far. On this particular issue of the, the laissez-faire genius of the market view, which as you know, in, in economics, at least in the 20th century, in the dominant school of thought, actually held natural capital to be infinite, to your, your earlier point. Yeah. Let's assume it's infinite. Let's begin with that simplifying assumption, which is ridiculous and beyond ridiculous, dangerous. How do we change it? Well, I, I think, again, in all humility, we're just discovering certain elements of this. We change it in part by understanding how mental models work, by understanding um, the actual workings of the human mind as opposed to the, the assumptions of you know, perfectly rational people running around who can process facts free of bias, who aren't swayed by tribal and other loyalties, et cetera, et cetera. Let's deal in the real world, please, and think about how new language, new invitations to engagement in new settings, too, can open people to different understandings. Here's a modest example. Uh, for more than a generation in the US, the attack on labor standards happened with phrases like job killing, for reasons we can all understand. Can't raise the minimum wage, it will destroy lots of jobs. There were many, many sort of variants on this. Instead, what a number of our partners in social movements have been able to do is talk about things like economy boosting jobs. If you give higher wages to those on the bottom, they tend to spend it. That's actually quite fundamental uh, to ensuring enough demand in the, in the economy. And there are other forms of evidence like this, which if converted into phrases and stories about real people <laughs> striving and trying to make their way up from the bottom, um, are much more convincing to people than some of the traditional language we'd been using. The last thing I'll say you already know, and that is we won't get very far using phrases like neoclassical, with, with, with due respect. We, we fall into a certain jargon. Um, and the shorthand may be useful with this audience, but in the real world, we need to really simplify our language. Great, an great answer. Ho hold on a second. I, I want to make sure I take as many people as possible, S sir. Hi, Nigel Kershaw, chair of the Big Issue Group. Um, just first of all, 
absolutely brilliant what the Ford Foundation have done in terms of putting a billion pounds of social investment. Should be applauded. Thank you. Um, Let's applaud it. That's, I agree. And real leadership to challenge those institutional investors to put their money where their mouth is instead of asking for their clients' money to do their own work for them. And I think that is the biggest challenge we face in the social investment world is taking that, that fight to them to say, to do that. So you better have a question. Question, yeah. The question <laughs> is, you know me, <laughs> the question is, um, in terms of that billion dollars in social investment, where do you see the SPI index in that? Mm, wonderful. Well, on one hand, um, for those who are less familiar, I'll just add 10 seconds. Please. We announced recently that we'll be carving out a, a billion dollars of our endowment and commit it, uh, committing it to mission investing, so committing it to earning both financial return and, and social return or, or social impact over the next decade. And we're going to begin in sectors that al align very highly with uh, inequality and the kinds of things we see uh, in, the, in the SBI. For example, housing affordability in the U.S. It aligns very well. We have expertise in the area. We know it very well. So we understand what the opportunities are to invest. And there is a substantial pipeline to invest in. Uh, we want to be very honest. That, that pipeline is important as well. Ditto financial inclusion in the emerging markets. So in India, in uh, Kenya, in Nigeria, and other parts of the emerging market, there are tremendous opportunities, some of them driven by technology change, so-called banking without banks, a whole uh, series of ways to bring people who've never been a part of the financial system into financial services, credit and savings and payment systems and that sort of thing. Those are some starting uh, places, Nigel, and we'll be developing um, frameworks for gauging our impact, for gauging the social returns, not just the financial, working in concert with others. We're not starting from scratch. The field has developed some, but we want to uh, work out a framework that makes sense for Ford in this particular venture and share it very transparently so the marketplace can benefit from whatever we learn. Thank you. So. Alberto Schuster from Argentina. When you see the picture of competitiveness, the U.S. is well ahead. But when you see the picture from the social progress, it's not that advanced. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you saw, we saw earlier, it's not up to the, uh, the top. Okay? In your view, what's the reason? Mm. I think there are a number of, of reasons. Um, and they relate closely to this emergence of an extreme inequality, this, this growth of inequality in multiple dimensions, by the way, economic, political, social. You know, following the Second World War, there was one kind of social compact, quite frankly. There was one sort of understanding of business and government and civil society working as, as partners. We're not going to return to those conditions of 60 years ago, granted. The economy functions differently. The, the nature of the family is, is different today. So many things have, have changed. But I think that um, in the 60s and beyond, we lost the thread, so to speak. We lost the shared understanding of how vital inclusion is to any long-run prosperity. And there's a lot to say about why that was and who played a role, as you know. And these are important debates for us to have in, in every country, not just the US, of course. But I think those are some of the headlines why. OK, just before we go to the next question, I want to I want to warn Zav that at the end, I'm going to ask if you would give us a highly personal prescription for what might you might be doing in, the, in your next 12 or 24 months mm -hmm. that isn't at the level of macro abstraction. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happens at, at, at meetings like this is that we operate at a level entirely of policy and, and political economy. And then we go home and we operate at the level of citizenship or activist or, or family member or whatever it might be. And I, sometimes, I'm, I find it quite interesting to see where those bridges are. So I'm going to ask an almost impossibly difficult question for the, for the very, for final, the up, very final one. I give you a, bit, a little bit of warning. Meanwhile, the next question. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Reiner. I'm from Boulder, Colorado in the US. 
And um, you mentioned beforehand that in the 60s there was the belief, is this working? Yeah. It is. Okay. There was the belief in the 60s that you know, progress will always go up. And uh, obviously, you know, time has proven it's not always the case. So now my question is, being a mathematician... Although it's too early to tell. <laughs> being a mathematician by heart, I always like to put things into a function. So if you look at the progress defined by yourself, you know, there are three possibilities. It could be either like the stock market, ups and downs, but mm -hmm. the long-term trend is up. Mm -hmm. It could be flat for a long time, or we could be beyond the peak and going down right now. So where, what do you think, what curve is the best description of the future of us? Mm. So uh, being a mathematician, as you will know, it, it sort of depends on which dimension and, and which metric <laughs> or, or, or which composite you're paying attention to. I believe there's a lot to speak for the ups and downs, the, the one you call the stock market option. Um, of, of progress and then some, some retrogression, in other words, instability, um, on, on multiple dimensions. I, I, think, I think it's also fair to say there are certain challenges that are existential, uh, climate-related risks in particular. Uh, Broadly mentioned nuclear non-proliferation when we had our little exchange at the, at the table this morning about the biggest challenges. There are things like that that cannot be measured on a scalar in the, in the same way. Um, we've either not been aware of them in the past, we've not understood the nature of the threat. Um, so it's a little difficult to, to put them on the same time series, but I do think that whatever you subscribe to and whether you, you know, Im imagine a major inflection point down or, or up or whatnot, just acknowledging that progress is not a steady thing and that some of the changes we want to work on together uh, represent the work of, of generations. Uh, to a great degree, it's about enabling um, a next generation to take it further. It's about helping to shift the terms of the debate and make sure it's everyone's debate. Yeah. They actually feel they're in the room and, and being heard. This gets to the answer I will give you when we come around to what am I gonna do personally over the next year or two. But that's how we think about it. Okay, good answer. We have time for one more, if there is, yes. Good morning and nice to be with you. My name is Hilda, I'm from Iceland and I work for the television station called N4. And I'm just very curious because I love communication and I think that there's so many things that we can, just like marriage, I don't think that more communication is actually better communication as we see when we have more media and more telephones and so, so on. So my question is just an opinion. What role does the media, in your opinion, play in the social progress generally? Mm. Thank you, Ilda, so much for the question. Uh, Quick answers are, I think, an enormously important, a changing role, number two. It's changing around the world, as you know very well. Um, also, to the earlier point, I, I also think it's a, th a threatened role, and it's threatened from a variety of sources, not just technology-driven change that has upended the, the, the business models, if you will, for things like investigative journalism, um, but other sorts of changes. It changes in the, the norms for uh, treating information, for thinking about facts, um, uh, you know, a kind of contesting of, of what is to be trusted, what sorts of institutions are to be trusted. And again, I'm not just wringing my hands here and sort of giving up in any way, but we have seen the erosion of trust across the board on, in all sorts of institutions that 40 years ago enjoyed much greater respect and trust. And that's a problem. So I, th I think an enormously important role, uh, a complicated one still. And if I am excited by one thing in this particular piece of the conversation, it's the opportunity to contest and to create and to define new roles and not simply to preserve you know, what we thought we had before. But certain functions I think will always be important, including the watchdog function, yeah. the inquiry, okay. tremendously important. And there's a session on some of these very topics this very afternoon. Okay, finally, can you give us something to take home to, to inflect our real lives mm. before we conclude? Mm. I, I'll share two things that I am I'm personally very committed to, relates clearly to the, the more macro themes in, in, our, in our conversation, but it has to do with my own investments of, of time and my own convictions about where some of the progress will come from. 
Number one, we have made this financial commitment. It's in a world which, as you know, is quite conservative on, on multiple dimensions. Can't think about anything other than financial return, need to focus on, on X, or we're not doing our jobs. So we're a part of a movement to change that. We do see that as, as fundamental to ensuring progress on a range of dimensions that we care about. And for me personally, that means showing up in rooms where people are skeptical. Uh, in lots of different rooms where people are skeptical. On multiple continents, by the way. It, it isn't uh, exactly the same conversation everywhere. So that's, that's number one. And I'm excited by that. I'm doing it in China. Uh, I'm doing it in Latin America, uh, not just in America, uh, and other parts of the world as well. Number two, let me say a word about rural communities for a moment. One of the broad, you know, sort of multi-generational changes we've seen, of course, is, is urbanization. It changed the West initially 100, 150 years ago. It fundamentally changed our society, our democracy, our economy, all of it, culture. It's changing much of the rest of the world now and at a rapid clip. And um, it does not automatically lead to, needless to say, uh, a, a sense of interdependence, um, a sense of the dignified and important role that rural communities can and should continue to play around the world. And for me personally, the next year or two likewise includes showing up, being a part of the engagement where you're listening at least as much as you're talking to people who feel very left behind, very ignored, um, and literally invisible in the way a lot of our mainstream media and ed entertainment and popular culture is trending. And that I think is important. Show up. Learn from people who don't know stuff you know. Fantastic message, thank you. We've run out of time. Thank you very much for your questions and for your support, but thank you in particular thank to you, Zav for your insights. Fantastic.